University of Buckingham, Money, Banking and Financial Markets, Summer Term, July to September 2020. Before we start the lecture, that's uh, again the normal slide to tell you that despite online learning, the student experience at Buckingham is still for here for you and there are details on the Students' Union, Career Services, Students First and Student Conduct. Please uh, keep these details and use them services if you need them. This week we'll be talking about banks and the process of credit creation or how banks are involved with the process of increasing money where of course uh, we're talking about uh, broader money. So Michigan uh, chapter 9 is relevant, contents of lecture 3. We'll talk first about how banks actually are involved in the creation of money process and the fractional reserve system and then a little bit more about how do banks actually operate. Well first we'll be explaining how banks create money by accepting deposits and, and making loans. We'll define a fractional reserve banking system and explain why banks can lend much more than they keep in reserves. We'll explain how the what's called the money multiplier works and how it makes monetary policy decisions potentially very powerful. We will define uh, what a money leakage is and explain how it affects the actual size of the money multiplier. Well, creating money. Banks, financial institutions act as a bridge between savers and borrowers. A bank's ability to make loans, in other words to create money, is limited to a certain percentage of, the, of its total customer deposits, which you will see and banks must hold a percentage of their total deposits as reserves, as insurance in a sense. Who are the main players in the US process of money creation? Um, in the US it's a central bank, the Federal Reserve System, banks, depository institutions, financial intermediaries and depositors, both individuals and institutions who deposit money through their savings. And of course in the United Kingdom uh, the same players except the Bank of England rather than the Federal Reserve. What does the Federal Reserve's balance sheet look like? Well, its liability, main liability is the currency which is in circulation and uh, any reserves which are held because if a, if a bank deposits reserves with, with the Federal Reserves, Re Federal Reserve, then these are reserves which ultimately the Federal Reserve owes to the bank. Its assets are securities. Um, for example, in quantum easing, uh, the Federal Reserve has been buying lots and lots of both government bonds and um, corporate bonds. These are securities. And any assets, any loans it makes to financial institutions on whatever terms. If it lends money to a bank in the short term, then that is an asset to the Federal Reserve. So liabilities, the currency in circulation, the hands of the public, reserves, the bank deposits at the Fed, reserve and vault cash, assets, government securities, holdings by the Fed that affect the money supply and earn interest, discount loans, provide reserves to banks and earn a discount rate. So if, for example, a bank, the Federal Reserve might lend money to a bank in the short term uh, so that it actually tops up its reserves and this would uh, the Federal Reserve would earn a discount rate for the, for this money. The monetary base is the currency in circulation plus the total reserves of the banking system. And as you know there's broader money when you actually start including on top of that the uh, deposits created by the banking system. But we'll see how these deposits are now created. Well, banking reserves. There's first a reserve ratio and a reserve requirement. For example, if money is deposited with a bank, say $100, 
then it may re regard people putting money in the bank, people taking money out of the bank on a day-to-day day -day basis. It may find that it only needs around about $10 or 10% to actually meet these uh, deposits, daily deposits and withdrawals. So this is what the bank would determine it's a reserve ratio. And this is the level of reserves a bank will actually hold as a percentage of its total deposits. And of course it lends out the rest. But the reserve ratio is it an insurance for the bank what it believes it needs on a daily, daily basis. Reserve requirement on the other hand is a minimum required level of reserves a bank must hold as cash or as a federal deposit. So this could be over and above the reserve ratio which the bank feels. The bank might feel it only needs 10%. The reserve requirement in the, this particular due restriction may be uh, 15%. So it may it may require 15% of its um, total uh, reserves held in short-term or liquid cash or some deposit with the uh, the central bank. So these two are different reserve ratios. What the bank thinks it needs for its to maximise its profits. The reserve requirement is what it legally must keep in terms of reserves. So how does the fractional reserves banking system work? If a bank receives a deposit, a portion of that, as we said, possibly 10% or some other percentage, is held in reserve. The remainder is actually lent out and this begins the process of money creation. So let's say $1,000 is deposited into a bank. Some of this will be held in reserves, cash reserves at the bank, or deposits made at the Federal Reserve for either legal or, or um, prudential reasons. And the rest of it, it lends out to um, consumers, possibly to buy a car, go on a holiday, um, buy a house, and to businesses, again, possibly... Um, to buy assets for the, for the business as part of working it's it's average day-to-day -day working capital or as a longer term loan perhaps for a factory <clears throat> so how does money creation work well banks create money by lending the excess reserves in other words the reserves which it feels it doesn't need on a daily basis so suppose a thousand dollars is deposited in bank a and the reserve requirement is 20%. Its balance sheet would look like uh, something like the following. Its liabilities are the money which has been deposited, which it's, it obviously pays interest on to those people who uh, require it, or if it's a current account, no interest at all, but it's for their convenience. So if all those people wanted their money back, the, that they would have to bank would have to give it, which is therefore the liability of the bank. The bank's assets are the money which it ho holds aside in, in cash, uh, which is its reserves or, or other very, very liquid assets. And if it then makes loans, um, that's a 20% requirement, but let's say it then makes loans of £800 by opening deposits for uh, new customers. So these are loans are they're effectively assets because the bank can call in these loans at any time if it need if it needs to to turn them back into cash should this be necessary. Hundred dollars is lent to somebody who wants to buy um, a piece of equipment, uh, a machine, for example, a company. Then it actually will actually purchase that machine, possibly by a cheque, they, they, they've been creating a, an account in, in the first bank, in, in purchasing it they will pay that £800 into another bank. So the second bank, Bank B, receives the um, £800, £800 as a deposit from the customer who sold the machine to the uh, customer who's lent the money. That uh, Bank B now has the extra deposits of £800 and it will keep 20% in reserves and lend out another 80%, which would in this case would be loan of 640 to yet another customer, customer bank B.
So bank uh, B's uh, liabilities or the deposits it's actually um, it's actually had deposited by the person who sold the the machine to the other customer of bank A. They keep $160 from reserves and they lend out um, $640 to other customers. This process would continue with another round uh, to Bank C. Bank C then gets a deposit of $640 and keeps reserves of 20%, which is $128, and then makes loans of $512. So each time new deposits are made from the original $1,000, money is actually created in terms of deposits. So the total amount so far created from banks A, B and C from the original $1,000 uh, deposit is all three banks together have um, deposits of $2,444, which is their liabilities. They've kept, the three banks have kept reserves collectively of $488 which is their assets, plus they also have uh, made out loans of $1,952, which are also assets because they've lent money which they could call that money in if need be at some point. If the process continues all the way through the um, more and more banks, then the $1,000 original deposit will turn inevitably through the process continuing into five thousand dollars in deposits so the all the banks together a b c d e f g all the others are involved will now have liabilities of deposits of five thousand which is the original thousand dollar deposit plus four thousand which is created reserves collectively of a thousand dollars and they will have made four thousand dollars in loans so the thousand dollars originally has turned into a total of $500,000 in deposits and as we know bank deposits are, are money. So if that original money was created by somebody deposit that money say for the, the Federal Reserve then that would go through the banking system to create $5,000 in deposits. The money multiplier measures the maximum amount the money supply in other words money supply being um, original cash which is deposited and all deposits created can increase when new deposits enter the system and we saw it's 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 a fraction of the reserves um, we saw that if, the, if it was 20% it went through the particular process if it was 10% more would be re, would be uh, created so the ultimate money multiplier you can calculate as the um, end of this process is equal to 1 divided by the reserve requirement or the reserves which if, if there's no reserve requirement the, the reserves to the banks feel they've got a hold to insure themselves against having any kind of bank loan. The lower the reserve requirement obviously the higher the money multiplier and the greater uh, the rise in the money supply which can be created by an uh, initial deposit. So uh, another example, a new $100 deposit can lead up to a $1,000 increase in the money supply when the reserve requirement is 10% rather than 20% as in the previous example. So here we have a um, $100 deposit in, in a bank nice uh, solid columns and so on bank looking like greek temples which of course um people used to leave their money in temples so that's it's not accidental that banks look solid uh temple like institutions keeps 10 percent reserves loans 90 percent out to um borrowers they deposit that money that 90 pounds enters another banking system another bank keep $9 reserve, lending out $81, which is 90%, and so on. So the reserve requirement of 10% would mean that a $100 deposit could lead to an increase in the money supply of $1,000.
money can be created by the banking system um, but money can also leak out of the banking system so a leakage is the departure of money from the lending cycle because of an action taken by a bank by an individual a business or possibly even by a foreign entity and leakages can cause the actual money multiplier in reality to be lower than the potential money multiplier what can cause money leakages banks choosing to hold excess reserves over and above their legal requirements individuals and businesses holding money in cash in other words increasing their savings behavior but, but using uh, rather than financial assets increasing the cash holdings or cash held by foreign consumers businesses and governments uh, US dollars uh, a lot of them are actually held abroad which would actually leak money out of the US money creation system in this case we can adjust the money multiplier to take account of uh, leakages so if the money multiplier is 1 divided by the reserve requirement a leakage adjusted multiplier would be 1 divided by the reserve requirement plus any excess reserves plus um, uh, cash holdings by uh, individuals for <coughs> governments and companies so the money creation process is not automatic cash holdings will stop the process or slow it down currency itself has no multiple deposit expansion banks may not use all of their excess reserves to buy securities and make loans uh, or depositors in other words deciding how much currency to hold and banks decisions amount of excess reserves to hold can also cause the money to supply to change and obviously the broader money supply which includes deposits could actually shrink which it did in the uh, after the Wall Street crash liquidity trap in other words when um, liquidity is going into the system but it's not going into lending or into the real economy Keynes spoke of the liquidity trap when possible sellers of government bonds would hold on to them because they thought the bank rate could actually fall f further Tim Congdon, uh, the um, chairman of the Monetary Institute in Buckingham, speaks of a liquidity trap when commercial banks do not pass on their excess liquidity and credits to firms and families, customers, and so on. In the um, crisis of 2008-2009, and actually since then, the banking multiplier has proved to be highly variable. So the factors that determine the money supply, changes in the requir required reserves ratio, the money supply is negative related to the required reserve ratio. If the res required reserve ratio goes up, this reduces the money supply because it reduces the money multiplier. Changes in currency holdings, the money supply is negatively related to um, currency holdings and changes in excess reserves the money supply is negative negative related to the amount of excess reserves held held by banks let's look at a bank balance sheet so what does a bank balance sheet look like if it's total assets equals its total liabilities plus the bank capital which is the bank net worth what are banks liabilities well checkable deposits non-transaction deposits any borrowings the bank makes and the bank capital or equity put into them. what are the bank's assets its reserves cash items in process of collection deposits at other banks securities loans and other assets let's look at the United States June 2017 um, in terms assets can be seen as a uh, use of the funds and liabilities can be seen as the source of the funds which banks which bank which banks receive and here's some of the some of the items um, moving downwards in terms of um, liquidity so on the asset side reserve and cash items 
on securities, US government agency 15%, state and local government and other securities 6%, on liabilities, checkable deposits 11%, savings deposits 49%, Small denomination town deposits 2%, large denomination town deposits 10%, borrowing 17%, bank capital 11%. And then finally, the liabilities from the previous slide all up to 100. The assets use of funds, uh, we also see that where the use of funds comes to out of 200. So 13% commercial and industrial loans. 26% loans to real estate, 8% to consumer, 1% interbank, 9% other, and other assets, for example, physical capital, the actual um, branches in the which, which the bank owns. Again, 100% there to the uses of funds, and 100% the liabilities or the sources of funds. What are the general principles of bank management, uh, which banks actually do to, to make a profit? Well, there are several areas. One, liquidity management, getting assets that are liquid enough and um, converting them into assets w which they can make money on by lending. Asset management, acquiring assets with a low risk of default. Liability management, Acquisition of funds at as low cost as possible, capital adequ adequacy management, credit risk, and interest rate risk. These are the main areas of uh, management of, of, a, of a bank. Let's look at liquidity management and role of reserves. Suppose a bank's required reserves are 10%. Here we have a, a bank balance sheet with assets and, and, and liabilities. If a bank has ample excess reserves, a deposit outflow does not necessitate changes in other parts of the sheet. Reserves are a legal requirement, and any shortfall must be eliminated. Excess reserves, in effect, for a bank are an insurance against the costs associated with deposit outflows. The um, on the on the deposits. The cost is incurred for the bank is the interest paid on the borrowed funds. But the bank is effectively borrowing funds in deposits or longer term, and the interest the bank pays is the is the is the is the cost. The cost of selling securities uh, is the brokerage and other transaction costs. Borrowing from the Fed also incurs interest payments based on the discount rate, which the Federal Reserve. How else can a bank um, increase its reserves? Well, it can reduce its loans, but if it reduces its loans, it reduces the money it actually earns from those loans, so that reduces its profitability. So reduction of loans is a very costly way of acquiring reserves, and calling in loans obviously antagonizes customers and the reputation of the bank, and other banks may only agree to purchase loans at a substantial discount if it wants to actually sell loans to other banks. In effect, excess reserves are an insurance against the costs associated with deposit outflows. The higher the costs associated with deposit outflows, the more excess reserves a bank will want to hold. Banks also get involved in asset management. So to maximize its profits, a bank has to seek the highest possible returns on loans and securities whilst reducing risk and ensuring that it has adequate liquidity. Four tools in asset management. Find borrowers who will pay high interest rates and have a lower possibility of defaulting. Purge securities with high returns and low risk. Lower risk as far as possible by diversifying and balance the need for liquidity against the increased returns from actually um, less liquid assets. Liability management is a recent phenomenon due to the rise of large banks called money centre banks, expansion of overnight loan market and new financial instruments such as negotiable certificates of deposit, 
checkable deposits have decreased in importance as a source of banks' funds. So banks are increasingly getting their funds from the wholesale money markets. Banks must also en en engage in capital adequacy management. Maintaining sufficient bank capital helps present, prevent a bank failure, a situation in which a bank cannot satisfy its obligations to pay depositors and goes out of business. But the amount of capital affects the return for the owners, the equity holders of the bank. And of course, uh, capital adequacy management, there are regulatory requirements. How bank capital can help prevent a bank fa failure. Let's say we let's look at a high capital bank and a low capital bank. The high capital bank has reserves of 10 million and loans of 90 million. Liabilities, deposits of 90 million, bank capital of 10 million. A low capital bank also has reserves of 10 million and loans of 90 million, but only has bank capital of 4 million and deposits of 96 million. Let's see what can actually happen. Uh, let's look at the, the high capital bank and the low capital bank. It is possible in the low capital bank that the actual bank capital can go to minus a million. In other words, the bank is, um, is, is would default. How does the amount of bank capital affect returns for equity holders? A number of ratios to look at. The return on assets, which is net profit after taxes per dollar of assets, net profit after taxes divided by assets, return on equity, net profit after taxes per dollar of equity capital, net profit after taxes divided by equity capital. The relationship between the return on assets and the return on equity is expressed by the equity multiplier. The amount of assets per dollar of equity capital is assets divided by equity capital. So net profit after taxes divided by equity capital is net profit after taxes divided by assets multiplied by assets over equity capital. So the return on equity is the return on assets multiplied by the equity multiplier. I suggest you look at some some banks, look at their um, reporting accounts and make some calculations. Well, capital and adequacy management involves a trade-off between safety and the returns to equity holders. Equity, ho the equity holders' returns will fall. Uh, the less safety there, the more safety there is. But the more less safety there is, the higher will be the return to equity holders. So it's a trade-off. Benefits the owner of a bank by making their investment safe, of course. But it's also costly to owners of banks because the higher the bank capital required, the lower the return on equity. The choice depends on the state of the economy, levels of confidence, and of course, regulatory requirements such as the the borrow um, adequacy rules. Let's look at what happened in terms of applications and strategies. Let's say you're the manager of the First National Bank. You have to make a decision about the appropriate amount of bank capital to hold in your bank. To raise capital, a bank can either issue more equities, reduce dividends to shareholders, or reduce the bank's assets by making fewer loans. The discussion of the strategies for managing bank capital leads to the following conclusion, which has particular emphasis. A shortfall of bank capital is likely to lead to a bank to reduce its assets and therefore is likely to cause contraction as lending. Therefore, if there are shortages across the system, banks will reduce loans, deposits will fall, and the money supply will actually fall. So, how capital crunch caused a credit crunch during the global financial crisis? Shortages, shortfalls of bank capital led to slow credit growth, the huge losses for banks from their holdings of securities backed by residential mortgage mortgages, the so-called collateralized debt obligations. The losses reduced bank capital. The banks couldn't raise much capital on a weak economy and had to tighten their lending standards and reduce lending, which leads to a further shrinkage. Another area of a bank is managing banks' management is managing credit risk. <clears throat> 
The problems of adverse selection and moral hazards which exist in loan markets means that banks have to be involved in screening and monitoring. Screening customers, specialising in particular forms of lending, and monitoring and enforcement, enforcement of restrictive covenants. Monitoring credit risk is easier with longer term customer relations and loan commitments and collateral assets and compensating balances. And of course this involves some degree of credit rationing. And here is a, um, a sheet on um, managing interest rate risk, rate sensitive assets, rate sensitive liabilities, fixed rate liabilities and fixed rate assets. Also, gap and duration analysis is important. Basic gap analysis, the rates um, of sensitive assets minus the rate of sensitive liabilities multiplied by a change in interest rates will actually lead to a change in bank profit. So a maturity approach measures the gap for several maturity sub-intervals or a standardized gap analysis accounts for different degrees of rate sensitivity. Percentage change in market value of security H minus a percentage point uh, change in the interest rate multiplied by the duration in years. Uses the weighted average duration of a financial institution's assets and of its liabilities to see how net worth responds to a change in interest rates. So this can actually be uh, calculated in a bank to actually um, test what will, might actually happen. Of course, there are balance sheet activities, uh, loan sales, secondary loan participation, leading to the generation of fee income, for example, servicing mortgage backed securities, creating structured investment vehicles which can potentially expose banks to risk. As happened in the global financial cr crisis, a lot of the um, securitized mortgage backed securities were held in special interest vehicles which were actually off the balance sheet of the, of the banks. Didn't mean that the banks weren't liable for um, a default or a problem. Trading activities and risk management techniques. Um, obviously you can use financial features, options for debt instruments, interest rate swaps, transactions in the foreign exchange market and speculation are also other forms of off balance sheet activities. But it can be a principal and agent problem. A banks need internal controls to reduce this principal agent problem. Separate trading activities and bookkeeping, limit exposure, calculate value at risk and do stress testing. And one classic example is the demise of bearings, probably worth uh, seeing the movie Road, Road Trader, Trader, a venerable British bank more than a century old. It was a sad uh, morality tale of how the principal agent problem operating to a role trader can take a financial institution that had a healthy balance sheet one month and turn it into an insolvent tragedy the next. Bearings actually, uh, position it had to be given to the Bank of England and Bearings was effectively, its liabilities were greater than its assets and the Bank of England put it into, um, it said it was in default. Actually I was there at the time, very interesting story. But maybe um, we can talk about things like that in the in the tutorials. Many of the banks have failed, but it, uh, in the case of Bearings, it was a um, an investment bank, and uh, it was actually taking on positions off balance sheet through the trading activities of Nick Leeson, who was generating profits for the bank. But those profits, in many cases, were pay for profits, and when uh, and the the liabilities suddenly increased because they were a, um, uh, using tr trading in derivative markets. Anyway, a shorter a shorter one this week. Thank you very much. We'll see you in the tutorial.